How's it going everyone? Kim Blacktooth here and welcome to this video which we're going to look at the top 10 strongest cards to come out of Kill the Server's stress test number 1 and number 2. So somebody liked this type of video and so I thought I'd do more because it is a pretty good conversation starter. You know a lot of discussion can go on. It is pretty hard to put things in order of top 10 strongest since there's so many variables in this game. So my list might be different to your list and let me know if that's the case if you think anything should be shifted around. So I will be focusing only on the cards that were shown in Kill the Server's Stress Test number 1 or number 2. I'm not going to do things which weren't, um, which are new cards but weren't actually in the Stress Test. Things like Alzor's Thunder, we've got things like Dijkstra, the new Dijkstra. We've got things like the Young Berserker and the Berserker and things like that. Those cards won't be shown in this list at all. And maybe I'll do a different list that might include them. And so one last thing to say before we actually get started is... I won't be putting in some really, really, really base things. Things like Biting Frost. It is very powerful, but I'm not going to put a Biting Frost or a Clear Weather in because it's just so base and boring and generic that you probably won't see those in the in the thing. Or they could be number one. So watch out for that. Number ten. So my first card in this countdown is one that you may not agree with. I think he needed to go in here somewhere. Geralt or formerly known as Geralt Swordmaster. He is a 15 strength melee golden unit, a neutral one, so everyone can have him. And he is kind of a bit generic, he's just 15 strength, that's it. But I think it, this killed the server stress test, really just showed how useful Geralt can be. He really won quite a few games for people. Um, a lot of people before the stress test were thinking that 15 strength raw strength was not particularly that great i was a bit of an envoy i really liked it because it was you place it down and then you pass and they've got to spend at least two cards to beat 15 strength if they've got nothing else on the board and uh you know if you're northern rounds it's 17 which is really nice and you know it's just it's just a good card it's earned itself a place in this list somewhere so i put it right at the beginning because he is a little boring there's not much else you can do with him but he does he does win you games you hold him back surprise people with it it doesn't matter if your opponent has gone, you know, very aggressive with weathers and stuff. He's still very, very good, and he can still win you the game. So he definitely deserves a spot, because I think he's demonstrated that he's pretty decent during the Kill the Server stress test this week. Number nine. So our next card is Aeromancy. Now I said I wasn't going to put Bite and Frost and Clear Weathers in, but Aeromancy is a new type of special card. The reason I'm putting it in is because it allows you to do any one of the three for a silver slot in your deck. And I think that's pretty good. It's, it opens a lot of uh, variety. So basically you put it in your deck and it really allows you to do whatever you want when the time needs. So if you're going into a game and, you know, someone starts placing down a lot of siege units and you think, okay, normally I wouldn't have a way to deal with that. But Aeromancy allows you to deal with that just for the requirement, the cost of one silver spot. Which is, I think, pretty damn good, you know? Obviously, you want to make sure, it's because you've only got one of them, that you use it at the end of a round when they've passed, hopefully. But it allows you to cover the whole board at least one round, which is which is pretty useful, especially when the game releases and you don't know what kind of decks the opponents are going to play, so it's hard to control all rows. Aeromancy allows you to do that at least one round, providing you use it correctly. So I think that, that definitely deserves to be here somewhere. Number eight. So our next card is the decoy card. So this has remained pretty much unchanged throughout all the iterations, but it allows you to pick up any non-gold unit and replace it with the decoy. So the only real change that it's had is that it's more restricted. Since it's a silver card now, you can only have one of these in your deck. The thing is, the decoy is useful all of the time pretty much you know any deck can use the decoy because it is neutral but it's useful for any deck at any pretty particular time as well because you gain card advantage because you pick in a unit back up and place it down so you've still got the same amount of cards in your hand and you can reuse abilities so you can pick up any bronze or silver cards so there's a lot of options there, a hell of a lot of options. Northern Realms could pick up poor infantry and then place it down again to get a, you know another two get spawned and that allows you to you know promote heavier which is nice you've got things like Neneki or any other medics where you could reuse their abilities you could pick up things which encourage a particular row you can pick up things like Barclays L's which you know he'll give plus two to all your um, 
dwarfs, which is nice. You, you can pick up the operator and try your hand at a game of chance a little bit more and see what you get, you know. So it's always useful. Now, the reason why it's so high in the list is because obviously you can only have one of them now. And there are cards which could do this sort of effect, but they, they are better at it, you know. You have to play a little bit harder, but they, they give you this decoy effect and a little bit more, which is always nice. Because you've only got one of these in any given deck because it's been restricted to silver, things like the leader card Anya for Squirtel, she probably is going to be changed now, so decoys can't produce Dol Bluff Anna maximum because you're only going to get one, and that's probably not very good. The one last thing is you have to be very careful with the decoy. If you begin buffing your own units and then decide you want to decoy it, it will lose the buff. So if you start buffing loads of all your dwarves, for example, with uh, Dwarven Mercs and Barclays Elves and stuff like that, they'll get buffed, but when you pick one up, it will lose the buff, okay? But you have to be very careful about that. You can't encourage cards and then decoy it up because they will lose the buff. So you will lose a bit of strength there. And we've never seen it, but I think this might go for things like Giant Toad as well. So you consume a card, draw a card, and if you decoy the Giant Toad up, it's going to lose that extra strength that it got, and it'll go back down to five strength, which is a bit of an issue. So be very careful, and that's why it's in the spot it's on. But it's generally still a very useful card across the entire, across the entire game. Number seven. So a lot of you might disagree with this one. I put her in because I love her. She's my, you know, she's my special one. Neneki. I think she's really, really good. Now, she might fall down the list later on. During the Kill the Stress Test server, Foltes, Commander of the North leader card, could Foltes silver cards. And she was an excellent one to Foltes. Really, really good. But that was, I think, confirmed to be a bug now. She, he should only be able to Foltes bronze cards. So... You know, she's going to fall down a little bit, but I think she still stands on her own two feet a little bit. She's six strength, silver card, and goes on the siege row. So six strength is pretty nice, you know, it's pretty good for a medic. She can draw bronze and silver and gets to choose her particular target, which is always good. So, you know, you basically get two cards for the price of one here, and she's pretty good on her own. Now, the strength you could get out, I, th I think you could reasonably get 16 strength. Maybe later on you could get maybe 17, something like that. Which is better than, like, say, Geralt Swordmaster. Not for Northern Realms, because they get their deck ability. But, you know, 17 strength, 16 strength is pretty much the highest strength you can place down with one particular card. And she's silver, okay? So, really, really good. I'm thinking, like, Nineki and Trollolo, uh, stuff like that, you know. So, just a really good card, even if you can't fall tester. If you can fall tester... She was really, really good. It would win you games as Northern Rounds because six strength on her plus another card, fall test, another six strength plus another card. It was just glorious. It was really, really good. And I found I found the siege row to be pretty well defended in in the kill the service stress test. That won't happen in both beta when we get to build our own decks, of course. But really, really good. Number six. Number six. My number six is Bruverhoog leader card. So. He's always been pretty good, even the last iteration. He used to be able to pull out character cards, but now he can pull out silver cards. So that's not really, it's the same sort of idea. However, his range has broadened, so his usability has broadened, even though he was already pretty good. Silver cards now encompass silver special cards, as well as unit cards. So he's got a, he's got a greater range, a greater usability. And Bruverhoog is always a card which could do anything you want it to do, providing how you built your deck. Okay, so... If you want card advantage, you use Bruva Hood, pull out a decoy, pick up something from your deck, instant card advantage, okay? If you want to clear weather, providing you've got a silver card with that ability, like Sarah, she might not have that anymore, but you get the idea. Use Bruva Hood, pull out Sarah, job done. If you want to, you know, there's just so many abilities, like Medic, Bruva Hood, Medic, job done. There's, he's just so useful, and the opponent really can't do anything about him. It's not like Crush on Crate where he spawns two on crate warriors and you know the opponent will probably just weather them uh, you know there's nothing they can do about Brevo who and it allows you to make a choice whenever any time through the game you think okay I really need to pull out one of those silver cards now the one issue I had or actually two issues I had with Brevo who during the kill the server stress test was 
I was I was not very good at remembering what silver cards I had on. This is like pretty much a non-issue though because I didn't build the deck and it made me forget what cards there were in there. But that'll be a non-issue when you build your own decks later. And also one I one instance, I actually had all silver cards already because of the card draws and stuff like that. So at one point I played Bruva Hoog and I didn't have any silver cards. It still took a turn up, so it wasn't all bad, but you know, so you might have to it, you might have to take notice of how many silver cards you get in your opening hand, and uh, and then maybe play him earlier so you don't get one during the redraws and stuff. But again, he's an amazing card, very very good usability, and he can be whatever you want him to be depending on how you build your deck, which is really really good. Number five, the so mind number five is the giant toad. This came from the first kill the server stress test. And I really liked it. Loads of people really liked the Giant Toad. So it was 5 strength on the Siege Row. Silver card for monsters. And what it would do is you pick a unit card in your hand to consume. And you transfer the strength from that card onto the Giant Toad. And draw another card from your deck to replace it. So 5 strength is not much. But it could easily get up to like 11, 13. Which is pretty high for a silver card. And not to mention those types of... Ice strength seem to protect everything else, like the Ice Giant. If you can get above 11, it protects the Ice Giant as well. If you can get above 11, it kind of protects Nithrel a little bit as well. So everything sort of created high numbers and sort of protected itself. I said before, the Giant Toad was variable in strength, depending on whatever card you chose to consume. So it was really, really good to get that variable strength. So it's not always 6 or 8 or 10, which a lot of cards fall into, which are easily scorchable together but the Giant Toad doesn't have that issue. And one of the main reasons why it's so high on the list is it covers weaknesses for monsters. So there's, there's two main weaknesses, getting duplicate musters in your hand and not being able to play certain things, say on the melee row, because you've already got a Bite and Frost in play. They're, them two weaknesses, the Giant Toad solves, basically. So one example is you've got a Bite and Frost, but you've got a 10 Strength Fiend on the melee row. It's not immune to frost, so when you place it down, it'd be one strength. What a waste. So you use the giant toad to consume the fiend, transfer its strength onto the giant toad, and draw something in its stead. And the gi giant toad is safe on the seed row. So, you know, it covers that weakness. If you've got a duplicate muster, the giant toad can consume one of the duplicates and draw another card in its stead. Now, you do lose the little bit of strength in that case, because when you place down the musters, you've only got two of them anymore. But... I think it's a lot better to like, the example I'm thinking of is Wild Hunt Riders. Get rid of that 3 strength and draw something else, just to make sure that, you know, drawing something is going to be a lot better than wasting a card when you place down your Wild Hunt Riders. So, he really, really helps you out if you get a little bit of a bad hand. So he's a really important card for monsters to have in my opinion. Won't work really very well if you're building a Siege Rain style deck. Okay. Number four. The number four is Burner Brand. So on the surface, it might not seem like such a great card. Seven strength golden, goes on the range row, okay? Has the ability, draw two cards, then discard two cards from your hand. So there's a card very much like this, a special card called The Last Wish. That card is not very good. This card, you know, doesn't seem that good, but because it's for Skelliger, it changes everything. Okay, it's seven strength, so you always get the seven strength, unlike The Last Wish, which... You don't get anything, you just get a hand optimization. But in this card, you get the 7 strength, you get a hand optimization, so you get to draw two cards, analyze it a little bit, and then, you know, chuck away what you don't want. But because it's for Skelliger, it's a bigger deal, okay? You get to discard two cards into the graveyard. This will buff up things like Madman Lugos. It will help buff up things like Drake when he buffs everything in the graveyard and such. So. It's such an important ability for Skelliger, that's why it's so high up on the list. So you get card optimization, you get 7 strength, you can put things into the graveyard, it's a lot... You get a broader option with Skelliger as opposed to any other particular faction, because you might want to put units which you really like and really love, like the, um, the Clan Tersich Skirmishes, if that's how you pronounce them. You could put them into the graveyard because they get buffed when they get played out of the graveyard. So if you've got medics, you could draw two special cards, decide, okay, I'll keep them and put some units in there because I'll medic those units out later and they'll get extra buffed. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of uh, combos and synergy with Drake and Madman Lugos that Bernabran really brings to the table. 
And that's why it's, she's so good for Skelliger, I think. But I think she's a really good card for Skelliger. If she was in another faction, it wouldn't be that good. But for Skelliger, she's, she's pretty damn good. Number three. So my next one is Avalak. Okay, the monster deck had this in the Kill the Server Stress Test number two. And he's got a bit of a buff, actually. He plays very much the same way. You place him as a disloyal spy on the opponent's side and give them the four strength. And you draw two cards and your opponent draws one. So you get one card advantage because your opponent's drawing a card as well. But he's got a bit of a buff. He used to be like 10 or 12 strength. But now they've reduced him all the way down to four. So I think... He's a golden card as well, so he can't be reused or nerfed in any way, but... Four strength is like the lowest spy there is, which is really, really powerful. Okay, you get to draw two cards, and there is a way to negate the one card draw that the opponent gets. So if you're building a deck that gives you a bit of card advantage, things like Decoy for Square Tail, that's two card advantage off the bat, okay? If you can wait till the very last round and the very last turn, so your opponent has passed and you've only got Avalak left. You play him on the opponent's side, you draw two cards and the opponent draws one. Seems fine, but because the opponent's passed, they can never play that one card that they drew. Okay, because it's the final round. So there won't be another round. So you can negate that one card draw that they get and still get two yourself, which is really good for trying to win that final round, which is really, it's just, it's just so good. Four strength is like the cheapest and drawing two, for you and drawing one for the opponent it is pretty good anyway it's a spy okay he's the cheapest one but then there are ways to manipulate it and that's what makes him so good as well i really i really like him i think a lot of people will use him with cut with decks that kind of build card advantage i like that a lot um you might see him get a change you might go up in strength i think he's so good okay number two so my penultimate card in this top 10 list is milva 8 strength golden card for Squirtel goes on the siege row. She's got a very odd ability, which is kind of what makes her. Return the strongest non-gold unit on the battlefield to the hand for both you and your opponent. So, whatever the strongest non-gold unit on my side of the battlefield goes to my hand, and whatever the strongest non-gold unit on the opponent's side of the battlefield goes to their hand. So, no one gets any card advantage from that. You get 8 strength, but you have to play smart, okay? And that's what I really like about this card. You have to play really smart and you can manipulate it so you can get a wide variety of advantage over your opponent. So the first strategy is that you can actually get card advantage with this card. You've got to play smart though. So the most common opening hand that you want to do, you have to sort of um, analyze the board as you go to see whether you can get this scenario working, but play any non-gold unit. So it doesn't matter what unit it is as long as it's non-gold. Now, you will get this card back that you place down now. So if it's got an ability, um, then you will get to reuse it. So look at things like Barclay's Elves. He will give plus two strength to all dwarves, no matter where they are. And being able to use that twice is really, really good. You know, you could use things like uh, Medic, but be careful what you pull out because that might have the highest strength. But it's still, still pretty decent, you know. You could Medic out something which has an ability and then bring it back to the hand later on. So play any non-gold unit. If your opponent plays a golden unit, so things like Geralt or Geralt Swordmaster as it used to be known, that's a very common opener on certain rounds, maybe round two usually. You've got things like Zoltan Shive, a very common opener for Squirtel players on the first turn. Okay, so you've got a non-golden unit and they've got a golden unit. You play Milva and suddenly you've gotten your strongest non-gold unit back and they haven't got anything back. So you manage to gain a card, and they've still got that hero on the board. It's up to you what you decide to do from there, but it means the opponent more, is more likely to pass because they've got loads of strength. They have to go first again. They're putting more, card, more strength on the board, so, you know, you get card advantage from that. Second strategy, a little less effective, but still works. Give, their, give the opponent something rubbish, like a Wild Hunt Rider, which is a common opener and get yourself something really, really good. Something like Barclays Elves or something really high in strength. Okay, so Milva kind of supports placing big minions down straight away. And so maybe your opponent will play a really rubbish one and then you both pick it up and he's got a rubbish card and you've got a really good one. One with ability or something would be really, really good. The strategy number three is Milva can be used as a, a late game Scorch pretty much. So 
You need card advantage to do this. It works very similar to Avalak. You are playing Square Tail if you've got Milva, so you will get one card advantage for your deck ability if played right. Maybe put in Decoy, maybe put in Yavin to get some more. So you should have pretty much consistent card advantage now. Your opponent, round three, placed everything he's got and he has to pass, and you've still got a couple of cards left. Now you play Milva, okay? You get your strongest card back to your hand, and the opponent gets their strongest card back to their hand. So whatever it is, probably something like the Giant Toad, 13 strength, back into their hand. But they will never get to play that card again because they've passed already and it's the final round. So it works like a strongest unit, strongest non-gold unit card, Scorch, for the final round. So it's she's got a lot of usability here. You see all these strategies that you can use her for? Really, really good. And you get to play your card again because um, obviously you, you've still got all the cards to place down. The one issue with this card that you have to be a little careful with, but you can use it offensively against your opponent, is that cards that are buffed lose their buff when they get put back into your hand, okay? So if you've encouraged cards with uh, that Skulled character plus three, or the opponent has played their Hawker Healers, which give plus three for everything on that row, when you use Milver and those buffed cards go back to your hand, they lose the buff. So you have to be very careful of that. You can use it offensively, but uh, just be careful of picking up cards which have been really high in strength due to buffs because they will lose it and you might lose the game if you think it's going to keep the buff. So Milva, on a recap, really strong card, has a lot of usability. You're allowed to play it, you know, have a general idea how you want to play it, maybe that last round Scorch style strategy. Or if something else presents itself, you could just use it as card advantage and stuff later. However you want. So before we go on to number one, there are some honourable mentions that did make the, sh the shortlist but never quite got in. So Shani. I chose Neneki over Shani because Shani is a gold card and she's she's pretty much nearly the same strength as Neneki. But she does get also plus two strength through Northern Realm's deck ability. But she also does promote someone. So she is clearly a good card but I wanted to just... Um, you know, broaden it a bit. Not everything has to be a gold card in this in this particular thing. Yavin. So Yavin is an 11 strength spy that can be placed on any row. Okay, so really good. You draw one card and then you minus two off everything on that row. It can be used in really nice ways. It can wound things and even destroy things. I managed to play it against a, a row of six poor infantry and it minuses two and they only had two strength. So... They just all got destroyed because when they go down to zero, they get moved to the graveyard. So, you know, he is pretty good, but 11 strength is a lot. You can negate it with weathers and stuff like that, but he is good, but he never quite got in. I, uh, no, <laughs> okay. Right, Triss Merigold is also another card that kind of got in. She is eight strength herself and she wounds for four and she can wound gold cards. So it's really good. She's a gold card herself. So if you if you take the wounding and the strength put together, she is 12 strength. That's probably why I didn't keep her in because 12 strength is mm, it's, it's pretty good. But I mean, Shani will be two promotes and that will probably go up to about 15, 17 or something like that. Geralt is 15 himself. So, you know, not not quite enough, but very close. Zoltan Animal Tamer was very close as well. He's got nice strength. And he gives you a lot of options. You know, you can place him on your row, the Doodah. Or you can place it on the opponents and possibly wound and uh, destroy things. But it works especially well with weathers. So you put everything down to one and then you use Animal Tamer to destroy them all. Really, really good in that respect. Zoltan Shive. Again, 8 strength Brazilian. I found this card to be really, really good. It was, um, it was hard to deal with. Well, you couldn't deal with it. But it was hard to deal with the strength. You know, 8 strength isn't much, but a bit of a buff. And, you know, he's just on the board all the time. It's constant pressure. It was it was difficult. He never quite made it, though. So the last card was the Operator um, that didn't quite make the list. I didn't want to put him in just because he's RNG. You could get something really small. You could get something really big. It's hard to, you know, really talk about that type of card. Um, he's, he's definitely a decent card. I think he will definitely get changed as well, though, but... Ah, no. I didn't want to touch it, so he's not in it for <laughs> just because he's he's too much. No, thank you. Number one. So, my number one is, can you guess what it is? Because there's been some pretty decent cards, 
You know, there might be a card that you... I'd like to hear what you think I'm going to say before I actually say it. That'll be really good. So my number one spot goes to Draug. Okay, so Draug was a powerhouse in the first kill the server stress test. If they got Draug, you were decimated really, really hard. So he's an 8 strength golden card on the melee for monsters. 8 strength is pretty good for any golden card that has an ability. Okay, and his ability is absurdly good. Destroy any unit on the battlefield with less than 3 strength. But it actually works as 3 strength or less, so it includes 3 strength. And you combine this with weathers and you just got so decimated. Everything goes down to 1. He just wipes them all from the board because you didn't, you couldn't do much about it. And uh, it gets rid of golden cards as well. The promoting didn't even work. So you had loads of poor infantry. They get reduced to one. Fair enough. I'm going to promote them now. They're all three. Draug don't give a shit, mate. He's going to get rid of all those three strength promoted cards. Wipe them from the board. He's just such a powerhouse. Really, really strong if they keep him like this. I could really see Ragnarok, which is the golden special card which plays a Rain, Fog, and Frost all at the same time, and Drow combo being really, really powerful. It would effectively wipe the entire board from non-gold units. Now, the reason he does remove gold units, but Ragnarok wouldn't affect gold units is why what I'm talking about. So, um, you know, really, it's just so powerful. Uh, he's definitely deserved number one spot. Let me know if you agree. I think he's just, oh man, too good, too good. But that's about it everyone, the top 10 strongest cars to come out of Kill the Server stress tests. I hope you enjoyed it, I think it was actually really really fun, I think I will do a couple more top 10s, you know, top 10 weakest I think I will do, uh, the top 10 interesting. It's a shame I didn't get to talk about things like Arch Griffin and Redenian Knights, these are, you know, pretty nice strong bronze cards, but when you're talking about the strongest, it's hard not to go on to golden and silver cards, you know what I mean? But uh, yeah, so let me know if your lists are different. Did you manage to guess Draug, or did you forget that he existed? I mean, it's, it's hard, he is so good though. But uh, yeah, so let me know how you consider my list and whether your list is different, and I'll see you very soon. Okay everyone, take care of yourselves.